It's Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. As Joshua prayed earlier, we just finished the Sermon on the Mount. It took us seven months, right, uh, from chapters 5 through 7. And finally, we're getting into chapter 8. But last week's conclusion was Jesus' authority in teaching. Because verses 28 and 29, chapter 7, they're amazed about his teaching. Now we're getting into chapter 8, and Jesus' authority in other ministries. So we want to just look back how we come to this point. Chapters 1 through 4 in Matthew, it was about the genealogy, the famous part of the Bible. A lot of people fall asleep by reading that. But the second part was birth of Jesus, temptation, and his baptism. And chapter 5 through 7, we just finished. That was the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' authority in his teaching. Chapter 8, 1 through chapter 9, verses 34, we're going to look at Jesus' authority in other ministries. If you take out chapters 5 through 7, the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 8 connects. Because there's a big one unit, 5 through 7, about his teaching. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25. Verse 23 is a summary of his entire ministry. So this is what it says. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Three things. He was teaching, proclaiming the gospel, healing people's sickness or weaknesses. As a result, a lot of people gathered around him to be healed. The last bullet point says, large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Everywhere they heard about Jesus' healing power, they all came to get healed. So large crowds followed. That was the end of chapter 4. And chapter 8, verse 1 starts with this. When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. Right, large crowds in chapter 4, large crowds in chapter 8, there's a connection. And there's one pastor who did this sermon, not on this particular passage, but he mentioned about this. Large crowds always followed Jesus, but only 12, actually 11, remained as faithful. Other people too, but they were the main people. And he said this, America has become a land of professional spectators. That is so true. The second bullet point says we gain most of our daily pleasures from watching others live out their lives. I know a few years ago, maybe still too, but a few years ago in Korea, a lot of people watching the people eating their food. Watching these people eating huge amount of food and they're so entertained. I just love this guy. I don't know what kind of life it is. It's really sad life watching other people eating a lot of food and you feel good about it. Why? That's us professional spectators. We just watch other people sleep. That's so good. 2.30 a.m., I'm not sleeping, but that looks... So that's what he said. That's what we're doing nowadays. What a life. Just empty life. And the same reason, there's a pastor, Kyle Eidelman. He has this realization about his ministry. Okay, this is no good. He tried to make Christianity seem as appealing comfortable and convenient as he possibly could do to others. He was doing that. He wasn't happy about it. So based on that, people will feel like this. Okay, Christianity or living as Christian is something that's convenient, that's very convenient for me. When I need something, I'm going to pray to God. He's going to provide it to me. When I feel some comfort, then He's going to give me that. But my life, as I go on, doesn't have to change anything. I'm just going to enjoy whatever I want to enjoy. I'm just going to spend my time or resources or my money as I please, and then that's it. God has to. He better help me out. That's our attitude. But that's not the right attitude as a Christian. It continues. He compares two different things. There's a fans versus followers. He says fans want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that it requires sacrifice. We talked about it many, many times. For them, Jesus Christ is like Santa Claus. So I want something for my Christmas, 
for my summer vacation. Please provide me more money, that kind of thing. But followers of Christ are all in and completely committed to Christ. Most of you are not married, but down the road, you marry somebody. And marriage means complete commitment between two of you. You cannot say, okay, I want this guy because he's making a lot of money, but I'm going to have a good time with other guys. No, that's not how marriage works. The person you're marrying may not be perfect, but you are making this intentional commitment together. You and I, we're one, and then we're going to go all the way together. Let me give you another example. When you find a full-time job somewhere, they don't want you to spend half a day working for somebody else. They're paying you and giving you a benefit. They want your full dedication. That's why they're paying you big bucks. The commitment is everywhere except for Christianity somehow. So this guy, he wrote a book, Not a Fan. It was a bestseller a few years ago. And that book was welcomed by few and criticized by a lot of people. Who are you to judge others as not followers of Christ? How can you label them as fans based on their lifestyle? If you always play tennis every day in the morning, let's say you get up at 5 a.m. and play tennis for two hours before you go to work, that tells me that you love tennis. So I'm not judging you. The other person says, I love tennis, but he never played tennis. He doesn't have anything to play tennis. Then he's not interested in tennis at all, even though he says otherwise. So I'm a Christian. A lot of people say that, but the way they live doesn't reflect any part of Christian value. So verses 2 to 17 in chapter 8, three major parts there. First one is a leper, verses 2 to 4. Also, it's featured in Mark and Luke. So parallel passages. And then you can see that. A little bit of variations, more information, less information here and there, but same story. And the centurion and his servant, it's from verses 5 through 13, also featured in Luke and John. And many others, including Apostle Peter's mother-in-law, verses 14 through 17. That's where it happens. So we're going to focus on the first part. And rest, I'm going to cover that next week. So a leper showed up. A leper came to him, Jesus, right? And bowed down before him and said, Lord. A leper. Let's take a look at what it means to have leprosy in the Old Testament time. If you are interested in how they handle that, detailed instruction is in Leviticus chapter 13 and 14. So you can look at it. So first off, uh, the leper who has the infection, by the way, when they say leper and leprosy in the Old Testament, they didn't really have advanced technology like we do. So when they have a similar symptoms, they said it's a leprosy. Put it away. Even though we have this advanced technology, a couple of years ago, or even now, some people say, do you have COVID or flu? Very similar. Unless you do some testing, you cannot really tell. So that's what happened back then. As for the leper who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn and he has to cry, unclean, unclean. He has to say, I am unclean. If somebody has COVID and says, I don't have COVID, then that's not a good thing. By the way, I have some COVID-like symptoms, stay away from me, that's better for other people, right? And second bullet point says, he shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection. The quarantine was instructed there, right? It says, he is unclean, he shall live alone, his dwelling shall be outside the camp, disconnected from the community, for the sake of healthy people. It's not because we don't love you. If you're okay, then you can come back anytime, but now, for the sake of the majority of the community, you have to separate yourself from the community. And somehow in today's church, a lot of people say, oh, we have to love everyone, embrace everyone, even though that person's still committing sin over and over and over again. While they're unclean, we have to tell them, you have to repent. Then you can join our community again. That's what's featured in Matthew chapter 18, church discipline. And people just don't love it. 
because it doesn't sound like loving community. But Bible says we have to. And think about it. You're one of your family members get sick, have COVID. You love them still, but you have to quarantine that person. I love you, but we can't eat together. We cannot hang out together until you get cleansed. Bible in the New Testament, it teaches as well. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. It doesn't take much. A yeah, small portion of population, when they become sinful, even at church, small portion of church members become sinful and don't want to repent, that's going to impact other church members. Not a good idea. But when we approach them personally, privately, and saying, you need to repent, you need to reconcile, they just leave the church. They don't want to hear any of that. They just want to be loved without repenting. That's not how it works for the sake of other church members. So application. And a leper came to him and then bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Very interesting application side of it because his prayer or request is faithful. Think about our prayer. Lord, I need this. Please provide it to me. That's how we pray. Not a bad idea. We have to give us our daily bread. We had to pray that way. But this person was so humble and desperate, he doesn't care about, Lord, I need this. If you're willing, you can make me clean. I know you, Lord. Please make this happen to me. He has nothing to say about his need at this point. So in Matthew chapter 11, it's very important because if you think about this expression, you can make me clean. In the New Testament especially, when Jesus healed these sick people, they used the term healing those sick people. But only leprosy is the one that's used in terms of expression, cleansed, make me clean, instead of healing. So that is a different dimension of curing some disease, right? Because they knew from the Old Testament time, it's incurable. When John the Baptist was in the prison, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus. And those people asked Jesus this way, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? So they're asking, Are you the Messiah? We've been waiting for the Messiah. Are you the one? And he gave them all these answers. Go and report to John, and he went on. And one of them was, The lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear, dead are raised up. It's almost equal authority of raising the dead versus cleansing the leper. And of course, the main point is the gospel preached to them. That's it. I'm going to emphasize on that because that was the main point, and I'm going to bring that up again in the next few slides. So Christ, what did he say to this leper? And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, because he got healed, right? Don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. As I mentioned earlier, all about this leprosy and how you handle it is captured in Leviticus chapter 13 and 14. So if you look at 14 verse 2, it says this, this shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. Now he shall be brought to the priest. That's number one. Now on the eighth day, he is the leper who got cleansed. He is to take two male lambs, and it goes on. A lot of other offerings you have to present to the priest. So Jesus indirectly asked this leper to do what the word of God says. First thing you do is this. This is from Matthew chapter 8, right? And in Mark chapter 1, we have a parallel passage, almost the same identical wording. But let me read it to you this way. See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded. Let me ask you a question. Why did Jesus say, say nothing to anyone? If you think about it, let's say some miracle happened to me. I prayed to God and somehow he planted not one, but two money tree in my backyard. 
So the tree just yield money from there. I love it, right? So if I go and then tell the people about this miracle, what would they say? I want that miracle too. He didn't want that. That was not the main point. Because in Luke 19, he said this, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the main point. Not just healing and giving you some food. By 5,000 people, I'm feeding them. That's not my main point. My main point is I want to save you because even if I heal you right now, after you got healed, guess what happens? When I get older, I'm going to die again, physically. I want to give you the eternal life. I want to save you. That's why he said, don't say anything to anyone. It was not captured in Matthew chapter 8, but in Mark 1, what did the leper do? But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city. So he was messing up everything, but stayed out in unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. For what? To be cured by Jesus. He's a miracle worker. Look at me, I got cleansed. But that was not the main point of Jesus. As you can see from Matthew chapter 4, remember, he was teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel message, and healed people, right? There's an order of things. When you read the Bible, there's a reason why you have different orders. For example, if you look at Matthew chapter 10, there's a list of the disciples. The disciples list appears a few times in the gospel messages, but they never start with Judas Iscariot. It always starts with Peter and other important disciples. Judas Iscariot always comes last. There's a reason why we put those orders. So three ministries that he did. Teaching was the most important thing. Proclaim the gospel message, of course, go hand in hand, those two. But healing was the last part. Not that it was not important, but that was not the main point. But opposite of this leper, there is a good example. When your prayer God answered. When something good happened based on God's grace and mercy, the reaction, the proper biblical reaction, was captured in Genesis chapter 24. This is the situation that Abraham sent his servant to find a wife for his son, Isaac. So Rebekah is found through this servant. So he arrived in this designated area, and before he does anything, he prayed like this. He said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today. He could end there. Yeah, let me make this happen. Give me this great opportunity to shine because I'm a great servant. He said this, and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. He knew the main mission was to help Abraham. His master was not there with him. But still, he was so faithful. And all of us, the Christians, should be that way. Not because your parents are right next to you or Jesus was walking with you. No, you have to be faithful wherever you go. Whether people are watching you or not, it doesn't matter. That's 24 verse 12. And after that, even before he finished speaking, things really happened that way, favorably. So he found Rebecca and then he heard about her story, her family members. That's great news. So right after that, actually his prayer has been answered. What will be the right reaction? I mean, think about your life. When you pray hard for some difficult issues for a long time, finally God answered your prayer. Then what will be your reaction usually? Yes, I've been praying for iPhone 15. And as soon as it comes out, hopefully I'll find it in my room. My dad will buy it for me. And somehow, on that day, you woke up early in the morning, you found your iPhone 15. What do you usually do? You open the box, you start enjoying the iPhone. Thank you, Daddy, and that was it. And you don't talk to your dad throughout the whole day. Busy working on your iPhone, right? That's what we do. When God answers our prayer, we enjoy what He gave us instead of thanking him too much, right? Thank you, Lord, and then just forget about it. But look at this guy. He's so faithful. He said this, Then the man bowed low and worshipped the Lord. 
He said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward my master. Again, very faithful. As for me, the Lord has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers. He knew God poured out his blessings and grace and mercy upon his master. He didn't forget his mission. As a Christian, we're not supposed to lose our focus on that either. Because if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Jesus is a reconciler between us and God the Father. Because our relationship got broken because of Adam and Eve. And then the reconciler, Christ, he made it happen. And then in there, right after that, it says, we are the ambassador of that reconciliation mission. So we shouldn't forget our responsibility and our role. That was Genesis 24. If you go back to Genesis 15, it says this, Abram, before he changed his name to Abraham, said, O oh Lord, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer the Damascus? So he's not even Israelite. He was Gentile. So he said he's the one. His servant, Eliezer, he was trusted by the man of God, Abram, Abraham, and somehow he lived faithful life. Somehow. Let's think about this. If you look at Genesis 15, verse 6, it records that Abraham believed and God considered him as righteous. We can think about Abraham's life and his lifestyle. Somehow, he influenced this Gentile servant to know who God is. He was not just talking about, okay, he's going to give me some uh, descendants. I'm going to have a son, and then that's going to be a great thing. But somehow, he taught other people. He showed other people that he's living by the word of God. And this servant believed in the power of God that Abraham believed. That's an amazing impact towards other people. That's what it meant to be as the salt and light in this world. If you just have a the bottle of salt in there and they're not using it, it doesn't do any good. You have to use it in your soup or different places. And we have a family member who uses salt all the time. We thought it was salty enough and he just... Psh. I wouldn't say who, Joseph. Anyway, so... <laughs> you have to use it to... Taste the salt, meaning there's impact, influence on others. We have to be like that. And he was like that. Abraham was like that, even though he was not a perfect person either. So true conversion shows you all these things. And John MacArthur said this. First bullet point, let's read the first bullet point only together. Ready? Go. True conversion takes place when, like a leper, Desperate people come to Christ humbly, confessing their need and reverently seeking His restoration. God's restoration they're seeking. Second bullet point, let's read it together. Ready? Go. The true repentant person, like this leper, comes with no pride, no self-will, no rights, and no claim to worthiness. If I think I am worthy of something, I can do something about life, and then I can save myself through my good works? No, that's not how it works. Think about this, okay? If something is rotten, that cannot make other rotten apple, for example, healthy or clean. We are sinners. Sinners cannot do anything, any nice thing, to become righteous. We cannot make it happen. It's a supernatural work of God. He makes us from rotten apple to healthy apple. Transformation. We use this analogy all the time. The caterpillar becomes a butterfly, but butterfly can never become caterpillar. So once you are dead to your sin, and then old self is dead, you become a new creation that's rebirth, true conversion, when it takes place, you can never go back to the old lifestyle. But somehow, we think we can go back and forth depending on the mood 
all right, today I want to be a caterpillar. Tomorrow I'm going to be a butterfly. It does not work that way. Because no one says anything about it. Yeah, you look like a caterpillar. I'm a butterfly. No, you're not. Then people get offended. It's not judging. It's just telling you what I see, right? Third bullet point says this. He comes believing that God can and will save him only as he places his trust in Jesus Christ. Not my ability, not my finance, not my intelligence. It's always trusting in Jesus Christ. So think about these three bullet points and what happened to the leper. The first thing Jesus asks of us as a true Christian is to obey the word of God, the commandments of God. And a lot of times people say, okay, the law, the word of God, the Bible, it can be very, very strict. It's taking away my freedom. What does the Bible say? You will know the truth and truth will set you free. So we have to be in that order, right? So the conclusion is this. From Psalm 119, if you have good English Bible, we have very well organized way of seeing it. Psalm 119 is organized as the order of Hebrew alphabet. It starts with Aleph, goes Beit, and each letter has eight verses in it. And this portion starts with 57, but from 58, I'm going to read it to you. I sought your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your word. If you are willing, Lord, you will cleanse me, right? That's the, the leper's attitude. That should be our attitude. Be gracious to me, period, no. According to your word. We believe in your word. So according to your word, be gracious to me. Not my will, not other people's uh, pleasure, but your will, Lord. Second bullet point says, I considered my ways. I looked back my life. I reevaluated my life and turned my feet to your testimonies, God's law. I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. A lot of times we hear the word of God preached every Sunday. Sometimes we look up our internet, great sermons out there, and then it hits you. Still, nothing changes because you procrastinate about following the word of God. But the author of this psalm, he said, I did not delay to keep your commandments. That's a great attitude. And as I told you before, it ends in verse 64. And last verse says this. Let's read that verse together. Ready? Go. The earth is full of your loving kindness, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. So it's all about God's love, his loving kindness, his faithful love based on his word. The earth is full of your loving kindness, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Give me daily bread. He didn't say that. He said, to teach me your statutes because that's the most important thing for me to live on this earth and for my eternal destiny. The leper, he was a man of faith, I would say. Because he knew how to approach Jesus. And he knew how to ask him about his situation. And Eliezer was a very faithful servant. But it's not just for those people. Not the psalmist who wrote this psalm. We all have to be faithful in that sense. So do not delay and keep God's commandments. So we can also receive his loving kindness and His blessing and mercy and grace upon our lives.